All right, Jim Gordon back with uh, another Small Cap Interviews. You can check out all our interviews at smallcapinterviews.com. Joining me uh, is a man who is a prominent figure in the financial service industry for more than 30 years. He has served as president and owner of Miles Franklin Precious Metals before starting Miles Franklin Limited, where he is the president and owner. Andy Sheckman joins us. Sir, welcome. Good to be here. Thanks Good for having me. You are quite welcome. Hey, let's start with a little uh, information on Miles Franklin. This February, next month, will be our 34th year in business. Uh, we have eclipsed last year $9 billion in sales. Um, we've never had a material customer complaint, something we're very proud of. Reputation in this industry really is everything, whether it's in your business or at a show where the, the public figures, the gatekeepers, the, the prominent figures who I've associated with for three decades, their whole message centers around reputation. And so it's something we strive for very, very much to make sure that everything we do is perfect. Not to say we haven't made mistakes, we sure. do, we make it right. Uh, we are one of 27 U.S. Mint authorized resellers, a, a, a honor we're distinctly proud of. It's a very low margin business, and so you have to do things right. Times it's been now uh, over 33 years, and uh, we're very proud of our reputation, so here we are. One of the uh, things I was really keen to talk to you about when I discovered I was going to be uh, interviewing you, uh, I really was interested to talk about bricks. Uh, you've been kind of sounding the alarm bell for about four or five years, you were telling me, and I. A, I'm amazed that this hasn't gotten more attention media-wise, and I'd like to get your thoughts on that as well. But uh, this is a this is a big thing coming if it's not already here. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it's the biggest thing out there, and it's it, the fact that the media has virtually no coverage of it is criminal. I mean, you're talking a group of countries that is pushing back against the Western hegemony mm -hmm. in a way that the world has really and never the countries, seen. Explain the countries. The countries BRICS would be Brazil, Russia, China. South Africa and India, those are the original five, right. um, the acronyms, of course. And when you talk about what's happened subsequently, last year in August, we had five new countries admitted, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, and um, United Arab Emirates. And <clears throat> this is a huge deal. You're talking the majority of the oil production in the world. You're talking two of the three largest nuclear arsenals in the world. You're talking greater GDP, greater human population. Subsequently, we've seen 30 countries formally apply here. The next meeting is in October in, in Russia, where there will be 200 meetings leading up to the October meeting in Russia, where many things uh, will most likely come to fold, whether it be the, uh, the inclusion of 30, maybe up to 40 or 50, because 20 other countries have expressed interest in joining mm -hmm. a substantial block that is being created. But, there's been a lot of talk of other things, such as a common settlement currency backed by commodities. And the Russian finance minister, the last name is Lavrov, uh, has repeatedly said, this is what we will be doing. Now, at the end of the meeting that was in South Africa, which is very interesting, because last year South Africa was president. Right. And so they rotate the presidency, so not one voice dominates the rest. But one of the things that a lot of people had expected would be a common settlement currency backed by gold or other commodities in August of last year in South Africa. Now that didn't materialize, but what did materialize is they said, look, we're going to trade in local currencies until this happens and task all the finance ministers to go back to the drawing board and come back and present their results for a common settlement currency in October in Russia. Now, this is a very big deal. And um, look, when you realize that the Bank of International Settlements, which is the most powerful bank in the world, <clears throat> it's a central bank or central bank, mm -hmm. that they reclassify gold in 2019 as the world's only other tier one reserve asset next to U.S. dollars and treasuries, in essence a riskless asset. Right. When you realize that the central banks of the world over the last two years have purchased more gold than at any time in human history, most of them in this BRICS group, you can see that they are formulating, they are plotting, they are doing things methodically, they are backfilling, and they are waiting until they have a substantial, call it uh, critical mass or mass adoption, where they have a large enough swath to issue it the right way. And I think they will. I, in fact, I believe that is what their intentions are, is to peg using distributed ledger technology and to peg gold and other commodities, perhaps, but for sure gold as its tier one status, yeah. to a new system. And this is a growing trend. One of the things that we saw that is very alarming. Now, I, I've talked a lot about Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia and all of the OPEC countries are on the Chinese Belt Road Initiative. Made a very big deal of that. 
uh, a good number of the countries are in the BRICS alliance as well or are applying to the BRICS alliance when you talk about the OPEC countries. But Saudi Arabia joined not only BRICS and was formally admitted here January 1st, part of the Belt Road Initiative along with every other OPEC country. They applied to the BRICS New Development Bank last year, big deal. They applied to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, big deal. That's the largest regional financial and military group in the world. Right. And they told folks at Davos a year ago, not the one we just saw here a few days ago, but a year ago that, yeah, we're open to taking other currencies for oil. And 20% of all the world's oil was sold in other currencies last year. But what we saw with the United Arab Emirates just about two weeks ago was massive. Now, and I think, you know, this is all part of the question, who is BRICS and what are they up to? Right. But it's one thing for me to talk about Saudi Arabia doing all these things. And I guess it's really important to understand that what makes the dollar the world reserve currency, it is the protection of the Saudi kingdom. And by extension, their agreement to um, value globally oil in dollars and take the proceeds and recycle them into treasuries. Right. Well, the day we, after we left Afghanistan in 2022, Russia and Saudi Arabia signed a military agreement, a joint military agreement. That, that opened the door. Big things started to change. And then you get all of the companies on, uh, countries on the Belt Road, the BRICS, the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the New Development Bank. That's all pr very provocative. What United Arab Emirates did is much bigger. And uh, two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, there was a United Nations summit in, in Dubai, right. in UAE, presided over by the state-owned, the chairman of the state-owned oil company of, of, of United Arab Emirates. There were 200 countries and delegates from around the world in the United Arab Emirates. Three days before they all got there, United Arab Emirates makes the declaration, and here again, to your question, where's the Western media? We will no longer take dollars for oil. MSN had one article the only one I could find. Right. We will no longer take, they are the seventh largest producer of oil in the world. They are an OPEC member. They were just admitted to BRICS alongside Saudi Arabia. Now, let me just, the whole thesis comes down to one thing, and that is, what if all of OPEC says, we're no longer going to take dollars for oil? Because look, you guys signed an executive order to go green. We respect that. Biden did that right away. Yeah. And you know what, we don't like how you've weaponized the dollar against Russia and Iran, two of the BRICS members, because we may be on the wrong side of your agenda. So listen, out of respect, thank you for the last 50 years, but we are now going to value oil in other currencies. Mm -hmm. Bang, that fast. That synthetic demand that has been created for the dollar has meant that every country on the planet has had to stockpile them to buy energy. If this happens, and not just UAE, Russia and Iran have said the exact same thing. No more dollars for oil. What if the rest of OPEC says it? Which I expect they will at some point. The dumping of dollars globally creates a, a religious experience in this country that people are not prepared for and have no idea that it's coming. Because if every country on the planet sheds dollars, mm -hmm. you have hyperinflation at our doorstep. And as that happens, the byproduct would have to be interest rates that spike to the moon to compensate for the inflation which is Klaus Schwab's moment, the Great Reset, the collapse of stocks, bonds, real estate, the dollar, and the banking system, just like that. Now we can talk about, if you'd like, why would they do that, but to me, this BRICS deal is a whole lot bigger than we are being told. It's a whole lot bigger than just groups pushing back against the Western hegemony. Yeah. It's about resetting the whole system because the dollar, the petrodollar, is at the center of all of these problems. So you were saying too is that, that if you go back 30, 40, 50 years, a lot of these countries were third world countries. That's right. Uh, but now they have the, they have the resources natural, and they also have the, the labor costs we weigh down. But uh, the media not paying attention, uh, they tend to chase the shiny objects uh, the way dogs say does with a squirrel. But what about the, the Western governments led by America? I, why are they not saying anything? Like, does, does Saudi have to tiptoe? Is that a balancing act? It to, is a balancing act. To jump act. in aggressively to BRICS, but then say, oh, but we've got our, you know, they do rely on America and the West. They How do. How are they balancing that? Well, and, and India's kind of doing the same thing as well. They're both kind of walk, this is a, this is a, a global tectonic shift. Right. This is once in a generation shift. And I think this is not something that will come easy. But um, in the end, in the end, if you take a look at Look, let's look at the dollar for a moment and, and, the, and the Saudi agreement. So why would they do this? Because, look, we have, according to the 2022 balance sheet, 2023 hasn't come out yet, but the 2022 balance sheet for the U.S. government showed $155 trillion in debt, $34 trillion on balance sheet, 
The rest, like Social Security, which is $77 trillion underfunded, yeah. Medicare, Medicaid, government military pensions, put us at over $155 trillion in debt, and they showed $5 trillion in assets. The biggest asset, 40% of our assets, is student debt at $1.6 trillion. We are insolvent, we are broke. The proceeds of, of the excess money that they make as part of the agreement is to invest them into treasuries. How's that work for them over the last two years mm. as the treasury market has obliterated? The, the Fed right now is pivoting, so they say, right? Signaling that we will choose inflation over austerity, as all governments have. So in mm. essence, if you're the Saudis and you're OPEC, you're selling your oil for dollars that are, are, have been and continue to be inflated, putting the proceeds into treasuries that got eviscerated over the last few years from a country that has weaponized the dollar against two of the three BRICS or two of the five original BRICS members, excuse me, Iran is not an original, but out of two of the five now BRICS members, right. and, and signed an executive order to go green. Um, and so when you look at the rallying cry, this is the rallying cry. I'll give you another example why these countries are pushing back, and, but doing so in a, in a manner that is plotted out and thought out. We invaded Iraq 20 years ago. We've, been, we've occupied their country for 20 mm -hmm. years. We're currently sanctioning 14 of their banks, and this is after blowing up their country and replacing, toppling their regime. We're sanctioning 14 of their banks for trading with Iran because they wanted to buy liquid natural gas. Right. And last year they made $90 billion in oil revenue that we still control, we direct it. They're not even allowed to direct it. And you talk about liberation, <laughs> it's occupation. And we're not allowed, so last year, Iran says, or, uh, Iraq says, listen, we made $90 billion last year, you're holding our revenue, we'd like to have a billion dollars, please, and we said no. So they have done three things. They have formally applied to BRICS and told publicly, said we would like to be a member if, if accepted. Yeah. They have made trading in dollars illegally. If you, own a, if you own a business and trade in dollars, you will go to prison and they will take your business. And as of January 1st, all green dollar bills are out of the country of Iraq, all of them. So that. when you talk about the, the hegemony, the pushback, these are the reasons and when you look at, at something as provocative as United Arab Emirates, which is a Western-friendly country, is, yeah, yeah. doing this step. Now what's interesting, real quick, is that after the meeting in UAE, right after everyone left, Putin, who hasn't left the country but for once or twice in the last two years because of the Western bounty, flew to the United Arab Emirates on an impromptu meeting flanked by four Russian MiGs. And what did he say to the head of the UAE? Did he say, we've got your back? because of what happened to Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. He then went directly to Saudi Arabia where the next day OPEC upped their reduction in oil production by two million barrels per day. So it's a situation that is, is evolving. And I use a phrase called logarithmic decay. Little by little by little by little by little, then bang all at once. Mm -hmm. And what we are seeing is a little by little by little. They have a methodical way of doing things rather than shotgunning where instant gratification is not fast enough in the West. They're doing it in a way that they understand that you have one chance to make this work. And I think that's why they are tiptoeing and straddling and doing things in a very methodical, thought out, smart process. It, it, I, I love the long game-ism of this, the, the, what they're doing too. This isn't gonna happen tomorrow. No, it's uh, not, it's, and they realize it's that. It's brilliant though. It's <laughs> well, it is, and it's plotted. And yeah. you know, they think in terms of decades, we think in terms of minutes. And if you're going to challenge what is in essence a five century domination by the West, mm -hmm. um, in every way, you need to have critical mass adoption. Critical mass or mass adoption, you have to. Yeah. And that's how, when you do flip the switch, in every capacity, you are ready to challenge, you know, whatever the West does in retaliation, hopefully not, not militarily, but financially or whatnot. Yeah. And um, I think really they hold the ace in the hole, and that is, you know, all of the majority of the oil production. And if you look at the countries that are involved, they also have the majority of all the world's shipping routes. So this is something not to be taken lightly, that is for sure. Uh, Andy, I want to talk, uh, changing gears here, I want to talk about and get your thoughts on precious metals investing-wise versus Bitcoin. You know, it's interesting. I, In my mind, I see both really cut from the same cloth in terms of ideology walking in the door. I'll explain what I mean. Okay. But I think both groups of, of, of people understand the reasoning to look to alternatives to the fiat system. Right. Um, and, and have similar 
viewpoints on it. And for that, I'm very thankful because there was a time in my life where I thought the younger generation would never, I was watching my older clients die and right. move on. And, and you know, because I started this company 34 years ago, and back then I was dealing with people who were from World War II and, right. and our grandparents' generation, and God bless them, they were the most wonderful people. And I started to think, you know, what's gonna happen with this younger generation? And I was, I was very happy to see the, the rise of understanding, if you will, of, of monetary and fiscal and geopolitical events that I think um, spawned a whole new generation right. uh, through Bitcoin. And they both walk in the same door together where the divergence is when they walk in the door of, of these issues. Bitcoin group goes this way and gold goes that way and they respect that gold people, when we sell precious metals, I look at it as wealth. Right. It's not an investment. It's been wealth that has outlived two world wars, German hyperinflation, the Great Depression, every pandemic, anything the world's ever thrown at it. And you are buying gold and silver because it is wealth that is has lasted the test of time. It's about preservation. Mm -hmm. The Bitcoin crowd goes the other way. They're going in to make money. They're going to become profitable. They want. They look at this massive opportunity, this explosion, and they want to make money. now. I believe that it doesn't have to be an either or proposition. And I think the way to win in any asset, whether it's stocks or precious metals or whatever it may be, is to take some of your winnings off the table and then reallocate them. I mean, that would be the way to do it. Now, some people buy metals with the intention of never selling them. It is a foundation they would rather pass on to their children because undoubtedly, in the year 3000, when the bills in our wallet are hanging from a frame in the Smithsonian as an example of what is or what was, yeah. gold, just like it was 5,000 years ago, will still be immutable. And so <clears throat> I think you take your, your profit on Bitcoin, pull some of it off, put it in gold and silver, take it yeah. off the table, leave your initial investment there. The problem that, that the two groups have is thinking that it has to be either or. And in my opinion, it becomes a much more solid proposition for both camps to take some off the table. You could say the same thing about the precious metals crowd. If you believe that much in these non-dollar denominated assets and the ultimate demise of the dollar, then take some of your metal, put it in Bitcoin, let it generate some profit, put those profits back in gold. It is a way to continue to embrace both sides, to understand both sides, because in essence, we all come in the door for the same reason. Right. So I think that it, the mistake is that it's either or, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be mutually exclusive of one another. You're based in Florida? Is that where you're making it? Yes, Delray yeah. Beach, yep. Uh, head office uh, is in uh, Minnesota. Correct. Great state. Yes. Uh, why is uh, Minnesota or Minneapolis, St. Paul? It used to be a state that I was more um, enamored with. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I will always be Minnesotan. But a lot of things happened in the state of Minnesota centered around defunding the police, letting the third precinct burn down and on front, in front of national TV income taxes at the top bracket of over 10%. I mean, there are things that happened subsequent to 2020, mm -hmm. all of those, that uh, kind of changed my way of looking at the state of Minnesota. And um, yet, for other reasons, it's one of the best states to conduct business in. As an example, Minnesota is the only state in America that regulates the federally non-regulated precious metals industry. You have to be licensed, bonded, and background checked. Mm -hmm. Holds us to a much higher standard. So when I moved to Florida, where we've had a satellite office for 15 years, I did it. I left my office there, even though I could have saved money in taxes by moving the whole operation to Florida, because I believe there's something to be said for being held to a higher standard. For posting surety bonds, for doing background checks, for having a license that other, <clears throat> other companies, other states do not require. And as a result, the majority of the companies in the United States have boycotted the state of Minnesota because they would have to be subservient to the Commissioner of Commerce in the state of Minnesota mm -hmm. the way that we are no matter where they sell in from. So as much as I am sad over what has happened in the state of Minnesota, I'm hopeful that they are able to, much like this country, you know, right the ship, mm -hmm. and um, at least on a, on a political standpoint, on a social standpoint. Um, and, but I will keep my company there because from a standpoint of what it means to our accreditation, to our, to our customers, it, it, it makes us, I believe, the safest transaction in what is a federally non-regulated industry. That's the most honest answer I can give you. Uh, talking with Andy Sheckman, uh, milesfranklin.com, we were talking about BRICS. Uh, I'm going to just shift uh, to wrap things up. Uh, let's talk about your thoughts for 2024. Any highlights, things that you want to mention? 
You know, I think there's a, there's a lot going on in 2024. I think it'll be a very, very, very interesting year. Not only do you have the elections here in the States in November, mm -hmm. but you have the, the BRICS meeting in October, where, again, a lot of, you know, who's going to be admitted? Are they going to issue a common settlement currency? Um, you know, are, are we going to see um, all sorts of events leading up to this? There's 200 meetings in Russia between now and October, 200 BRICS meetings. What does that have in store for us? So as far as that side is concerned, a lot to, to watch. And when we look at what's happening here, you know, in the States, uh, I, I am concerned. I'm very concerned because for the first time as a father, mm -hmm. more so as a businessman, I'm concerned. We have tremendous divisiveness in the United States right. um, where red and blue can't talk to each other anymore, where one-third of the country believes the elections are not fair. Mm -hmm. We have um, record debt, uh, record credit card debt, record mortgage debt, record student debt. We have the lowest level of savings ever, yeah. whereby right now 65% of the country is living paycheck to paycheck, 45% of the country earning over six figures paycheck to paycheck. Uh, we are not united anymore. We have lawlessness in our cities. We have open borders where 10 million people have entered illegally. Uh, we, we have a situation where the judicial system is being questioned by a majority of the people in this country, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. Yeah, true. And so when you talk about the problems with the dollar and the mismanagement and the weaponizing, if our country was united the way we were for the last 100 years, if we were a united country, if we were not divided, if we had respect for authority, if we didn't have open borders, if we had a judicial system that the world envied, and you know, Lady Liberty with the blindfold holding yeah. the scales of justice, that to me is, is really what concerns me because in essence what we are witnessing is a cultural war or a cultural whitewashing at the same time we are on the verge of a big economic problem. Mm -hmm. Economic problems with cultural problems become very dangerous and I am concerned I am very concerned that one way or the other you have half of the country that's going to be very upset about the outcome of the election and whether or not it was conducted fairly, yeah. which only exacerbates all of the other issues. So I wish my message was one of more optimism, but I think there's a fine line between pessimism and realism. And I think there's this fear that's permeating. Yes, there's opportunity to be found, mm -hmm. but there's concern that is permeating. Even if people can't articulate it, you can feel it. You can almost cut it with a knife. And I think this might be the most interesting year of our, of our my life anyway. And mm -hmm. there's a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. And I, as ironic as that is, really do believe that this will be a very, very interesting time leading up to the October BRICS meeting, which could be groundbreaking, and only a month later the elections, which will shape the future of the world mm -hmm. very, very quickly one way or the other. Yeah, a dramatic change depending on who wins in uh, November. Right. Uh, big differences too. Uh, and Andy, staying with uh, uh, 2024, let's talk about gold and silver. Well, you know, for the last two years, the central banks of the world, who are not only the most well-funded, but they're the most well-informed, traders on the globe, these are the people that know the playbook, mm -hmm. have accumulated more gold than at any time in history, ever, two years running. Um, and you know, when you realize that gold has reclassified the world's only other tier one asset, they are using the suppression of the Western paper markets against us. They're the ones accumulating all the gold and silver. Um, they're the ones producing all the gold and silver. And it's interesting, I've, for the last few years, talked at length about how the exchanges are being bled dry. Uh, accumulating all the gold and silver through delivery off the London Metals Exchange, off the COMEX, uh, off the, even the Shanghai Gold Exchange, backdooring the ETFs. Massive accumulation and they're using this Western paper price that is hugely, hugely rehypothecated and hugely and hugely suppressed. And they're using it to their advantage and now they're beginning to slowly turn up the heat. In Shanghai, uh, right now, the price of silver is roughly 10 to 11 percent higher than it is in London and in COMEX, on COMEX, where it's about two and a half dollars higher, mm -hmm. creating arbitrage. Gold has been between 60 and 140 dollars per ounce higher in Shanghai than it is in London or in Co on COMEX, creating arbitrage, slowly turning up the heap where traders who have access to those markets will buy in London or on COMEX and sell it for delivery right. in Shanghai. I believe ultimately the price of gold will go higher than anyone thinks possible. It is the only other tier one asset. The central banks who are suppressing the price so that they can massively accumulate it, understand this. And ask yourself this question. 
If the most well-funded and well-informed traders in the globe for two years running have bought more gold than at any time in history of central banking, what does that tell you? Mm. And just so people understand, just to be clear, clear on something, how do they suppress the price? This is not too long, actually. If I have 5,000 ounces of gold in my warehouse, I will sell 5,000 ounces on COMEX so that I'm market neutral. One goes up, one goes down commensurate. If I have 5,000 ounces in my warehouse and the price drops by 100 bucks an ounce, I'm out half a million dollars. But what I sold short on COMEX goes up the exact same amount. I'm market neutral with my inventory. Right. And I asked my head trader not too long ago, what does it cost for us to buy a COMEX contract for hedging? He says, oh, it's about five or six bucks for the trade as long as we have $7,500 in our margin account. And if it doesn't go against us, you don't get a margin call. So what if I'm a central bank or a commercial bank or a sovereign wealth fund and I have 500 million in my margin account? Right. Well, that allows me to control 15 billion of notional contracts. And so in silver right now, as an example, there are 1,500% more paper contracts than there are bars backing it. In other words, 15, there's 15 times more paper than there is bars. And so if everyone stood for delivery, right. 14 of them get cash settled. This is exactly what the Hunt brothers noticed in 1980. So what I'm getting to is that the, the smart crowd, the central banks, the sovereign wealth funds, the family, they're, they're gobbling it up using this suppression against us. And they always front run, they're always in front. I would, I would say the probability of gold and silver outperforming India imported 400 million ounces of silver over the last two years. That's, that's double what's on COMEX. So when you talk about how high will it go and when will it go, I don't know when it will go, but you can see that the biggest, smartest money in the world is positioning themselves before it happens. Right. And we will wake up on a Monday morning and bang, the price will be so much higher for whatever reason. And it's just the Western market being rendered a scam, a, a manipulated scam. And you will see the price setting mechanism at some point shift eastward to the Shanghai exchange, to the Dubai exchange, to the Moscow exchange, where the countries who are accumulating it all and producing it all and valuing it the real way um, are, no longer, uh, uh, are no longer beholden to a system that is rehypothecated, that is suppressed by a handful of commercial banks for less than, um, let's just say, less than pure uh, reason. And so I don't know when it happens, but I will tell you in my belief it goes higher than anyone thinks possible. And I'm not selling this to get rich. I'm saying that this is wealth that the central banks understand and realize. And I will go back to one thing, and that is if the most powerful bank on the planet, the BIS, the central bank or central bank reclassify gold as the world's only other tier one asset after over 75 years of it just being dollars and treasuries, mm -hmm. and now they're buying it at record rates, what does that tell you? That there will come a moment when they let it free, when, when the suppression is no longer available to do. And if you naked short and suppress a market when the whole world is trying to go after it, it's a very dangerous proposition. So the the manipulation is ending, the accumulation is increasing, and real price discovery will come. I don't know if that's in 2024 or 2025 or next week, right. but I do think that ultimately it will, and you can see that if you just take a step back and realize what these very, very smart, and not even smart, well-informed traders and players are, are positioning themselves for. Hey, it's, uh, I haven't had the chance to talk to you in a long time. It's been great to sit down and talk. Likewise. I appreciate your insight in some of the, the things I wanted to talk about, including BRICS. Uh, I hope we can talk again. It's uh, Andy Sheckman. Uh, MilesFranklin.com is where you can find more information on his company. And, of course, you're everywhere on, on YouTube and everything to see your videos. So appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.